Welcome, welcome, welcome. How are you doing? Good? All righty. I just wanted to ask you a quick question. How many of you would ever consider yourself to be a scatterbrained person? Raise your hand. Okay, okay. Well, I was uh, investigating this word because I feel a little scatterbrained sometimes. But I was looking at the definition in the Urban Dictionary and I immediately was mad and dismissed it and thought, that's dumb. I'm not scatterbrained. Because this is what it started with. I'll read you the first sentence of the definition. How many of you guys read Urban Dictionary sometimes just for kicks and giggles? It's kind of funny, right? Scatterbrained. A person, usually female, who makes no blankety blank sense at all. <laughs> I was like, that's it. I hate Urban Dictionary. It's dumb. <laughs> But how many of you have ever felt scatterbrained in your life or unfocused in your life? And you feel like you have so much more potential if you could just get your life a little bit more organized. If you could just zone in on a couple areas and, and be more disciplined and figure things out and have a system. And you guys ever feel that way? But instead you're like, ah, <laughs> with every area, just me? <laughs> All right, well, God bless you. Bye. <laughs> well, I've noticed this in my life personally and um, also in many of your lives, whether you refuse to admit it or not, but I talk to you and I know you and I just wanted to share some things that God has been helping me to understand and my prayer is that you would really receive something that you can take home and have a little homework to do in your life and figure some things out to make your life more focused more order, less chaos. How, how many of you want less chaos? Yes. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is full of wisdom and guidance and direction for us. I thank you that you, Holy Spirit, will speak to us this morning, that you will convict us and help us to change. And we give you this time. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Corinthians 14.40 says, But all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. We need to get our lives in order. That's point number one. If you're taking notes, note takers are history makers, so take notes, but don't be distracted by social media while you're taking notes on your phone. Get your life in order. So I begin to feel a super deep sense of conviction about this at the beginning of the year. And I didn't even know what it really meant. But it's been slowly developing, and God has been slowly working on my heart, and I've been trying to understand, what does it mean to get my life in order, to be more focused? And I was talking to Rich about this maybe two weeks ago, and I finally told him, hey, I really feel like we need to get more focused on our life. He said, me too. That's exactly what God has been telling me. And here are the things we're going to do. I was like, great, you already have a list made for me. Awesome. And uh, plans already hashed out. So we've been working hard to examine every area of our life and really putting purpose and vision behind each thing that we're doing. From the way that we think about food and exercise to um, ministry overseas in Southeast Asia, to the churches here and, and Mesa, our family, our finances, Every single area, we've been really investigating and examining and making sure what we're doing makes sense. So we recognize some stuff that we had been doing that doesn't make sense to keep doing. And we recognize ways of thinking that at the time when we started thinking the way that we were thinking, it made sense to think that way. But now, it's not producing the fruit that we want. Our patterns of thinking are getting us nowhere. They're getting us in places that don't produce fruit and are really pointless. So we, were, we had the privilege of hearing Dr. Henry Cloud. You guys know him. He wrote the book Boundaries. Nobody's read it? How many of you have read Boundaries? It's awesome. If you haven't read it, read it. It's, he's a super intelligent psychologist, genius guy, and he's a very, very saved he recently wrote another book called Necessary Endings. I'd encourage you to get that one too, but he talked about the need to end things in your life. And 
Rich and I are sitting there thinking, this is literally what we've been talking about. What he's speaking is what we've been convicted about, and he's confirming what we've been convicted about. Yay, we are actually hearing from God. <laughs> we, we're on track. It was confirmation that we were doing the right thing, head, headed in the right direction. So a couple things we wanted to do. The first thing was stop doing some things. Some things that we're doing in our lives, they don't make sense anymore. Maybe you started them years ago. Maybe your grandparents started them and then passed them on to your parents and then passed them on to you and you're still doing the same thing. And you haven't really thought, why do we do this? <laughs> why do we do this strange tradition? Um, but they don't make sense anymore. And some of them, they're not bad. Some of them may be producing fruit or be good in your life. But they had a season of being the best thing and now they're not the best thing anymore. So we're cutting them out of our life, anything that's not the best thing. We're changing direction and we're changing course. We're also starting some things. Rich and I don't wanna be married to a single idea. We don't wanna be attached to something because it's worked in the past. So we've really been renewing our minds and considering every aspect of our life. Like, is this something that we are just doing because it's a habit? Is this something that's producing the results that we want? Is this something, do we need to start doing something else, learn something new, go in a different direction? Um, a perfect example was in January, Rich preached um, uh, the vision of the church that it was, we're adjusting it. And we recently updated it because it wasn't relevant for our current season. So we changed how we did life groups a little bit so that it would be more relevant to where we're at. But you gotta, we have to do that on our life, too. Ephesians 5, 15 through 17 says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. The days are evil, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Rich and I, we both came to consider some simple guidelines on how do you decide what to do? How do you know what your focus is, where do you even start? So here's a couple things to think about. We have a certain number of days that we've been given. In the end, what really matters? If you died tomorrow, or even today walking out of the church, what would be the things in your life that you could say that was the most important thing? I spent the most time on the most important thing. Rich and I consider that because he was in the hospital with COVID, and let me tell you, that perspective on life has not left us. We value our life. We count each day. Don't waste, or we, we also don't want strings attached preventing us from being flexible for God. Things that tie us down, things that have us deeply rooted, things that have us, like, dug in to where if the Lord says, hey, go do this, we have to say, yeah, sorry, I can't. I'm too, I'm too tied down. I can't, I can't just go and obey you. There's too many things. You guys feel like that sometimes? <laughs> Overwhelmed by all the things? And um, Rich and I want to be waiting at the edge of our seats for our next assignment from God. And we're trying to simplify and repurpose and reorganize and restructure. So, many of us just let our lives happen how they happen, and we never take control and put order and purpose in our lives. And I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be like that. I've watched my whole family live like that, and I'm not doing it. So, this verse says, don't be foolish, but understand the Lord's will. I challenge you to understand God's will for each area of your life. What are you doing? Why are you doing it? Where are you going with it? Have you been just doing it because you do it? Is it a habit or is it full of purpose? Is it producing fruit? We also need to increase in wisdom. And you know what? Jesus did this. In Luke 2.52, it said, Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Guys, I just assumed that Jesus was born with all the wisdom that he needed. <laughs> but this is saying that he increased in wisdom. If Jesus needs to become more wise. Lord, help us, because surely we do too. 
And everything that we need is found in his word. All the wisdom that we need is found in his word. He literally left us with an instruction manual to increase in wisdom. And if you're not using it for your life, if we're not applying it to our lives, well, we're going to be stuck. We're going to be using or living a pointless life. Rich and I decided that we want our lives to be functional for the purposes of God and not just comfortable for us. Sometimes being functional for God makes it uncomfortable for us. We have to do things that make us uncomfortable, but it's what God wants and what he wants to use us for. So whatever things we needed to change, it's so that God can use us better, God can use us more, and it's really uncomfortable for us, and me and Rich are good with that. We're excited about it. So examining each season of life that you're in and making adjustments as you go is important. Luke 16, 10 says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. It's important to take the time to re-examine, to rearrange, end things, start things in your life, and that is doing the little. That is being trusted with the little. Chaos or having no vision in things like your finances, your health, your marriage, your kids, your home, your job, all those areas. If you have chaos in those areas, asking God to increase, you won't be increased because you can't be trusted with the little. If you're taking responsibility and you're taking your health seriously, you're taking your finances seriously, if you're getting your home in order, God will trust you with much more. You'll be increased. So examine the areas of your life and get it together. All the areas. If we're bad stewards of our lives now, we won't be increased to having more. 1 Timothy 3.5. This one's for leaders. How many of you guys are life group leaders? All right. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? It's your responsibility to manage your life. Don't talk about health to others when your health is out of order. You cannot help someone with their finances when you are not a faithful tither and you don't give. Right? Our, our lives have to be order because, in order because we are called to be examples as leaders. The good news is that if you're not an example in an area, guess what? There's this R word. Or anybody know? R Repent. Did somebody say it over here? <laughs> All right. Good job. <laughs> yeah, we can repent. Literally sitting in your chair right now, you can tell the Lord, Lord, I'm sorry. I am not being faithful. Please forgive me and help me, Holy Spirit. Bam, done doesn't have to be a three-hour crying session, okay? It could be like quick. You can be on it. If you can make a habit of it, it's awesome. You can renew your mind and move on. And then you can be an example how we're called to be. Marriage. If you're having problems in your marriage, it doesn't disqualify you from helping somebody else. What it does is sets you up to be an example of how to do it correctly, how to go through trials and storms correctly, Right? So we have to keep our, get our lives in order, manage your household, control what you can, and then give the rest to God. How often are we living on automatic instead of on purpose? Stop doing things that don't matter. Stop dwelling and thinking about things that don't matter. Get your life focused and get vision for each area. Determine what's important right now. What's important? All right, the second thing. So the first one, get your life in order. The second thing, get your mind in order. The mind is a tricky thing, and it messes me up more than my life. <laughs> All right, let me tell you a story. Luke 10, 38 through 42. As they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. So where was Mary? At his feet. 
Martha, however, was distracted by much serving. She went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. What a brat. Can you imagine disrupting Jesus when he's trying to teach him? Be like, you need to tell her to serve. <laughs> I'm doing the dishes by myself. Uh, that's, pretty, that's pretty bold. And this is what the Lord answered her. Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. And Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. The Amplified Version says, Martha, you are worried and bothered and anxious about so many things. So our minds filled with worry, being anxious, bothered, upset, distracted, troubled. I could go on and on. Do I have your attention? Yeah. About so many things. So Rich and I had the honor of attending a conference this last weekend. And the organization that we attended, they support the persecuted church. And when I say persecuted church, I don't mean it's the title, it's the name of a church over there with a billboard. It's the persecuted church means the church is being persecuted in other parts of the world. And so Rich had the job of introducing the CEO of the organization, and he had to speak for eight minutes. Woo, tough job. <laughs> so um, our friend was like, I, wa I want you to come and speak, and then I just want you to relax and enjoy. You don't even have to attend the conference. And Rich, was, Rich and I were like, uh, it's mission. We're going to be there. So we were there every second, and it was awesome. Um, but it was held at this prestigious resort because the top donors were invited to attend. So we literally are around millionaires. Obviously, I had to go shopping <laughs> to get something to wear around millionaires. I don't wear it. I don't dress like that, right? And um, surely Rich's black t-shirts and jeans are not going to cut it. <laughs> so <laughs> we had to get him some stuff, too. If you don't know my husband, he wears a black t-shirt every day. Every day, every day, every day. And when he doesn't wear a black t-shirt, I'm like, whoa, look at you. <laughs> you got a red shirt on today. Woo. <laughs> That's exciting. But anyways, we were there, and um, we arrived at 1 in the morning. We had to get up at 4 o'clock our time, so we were wiped out. And I woke up pretty grumpy. And I didn't know why I was grumpy. I was just irritated. And I got up. I thought, I'm just tired, you know. I tried to make coffee, and I spilled poured the water in the wrong section of the coffee maker, and so it went <laughs> all over Rich's wallet and everywhere. <laughs> I was like, <gasps> and then I was like, I'll order coffee. So I picked up the phone. It's four in the morning, and the speaker phone was like, Ooh, and I'm like, the neighbors. And then he goes, beep, boop, bop, bop, bop. hello, how can I help you? I'm like, stop, quiet, 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 because it's loud, and the neighbors can hear us. And the whole morning had been like that, like disaster after disaster. And Rich, <laughs> Rich finally was like, Annie, 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 Annie. I'm like, <gasps> what? He's like, whatever you're doing, whatever this is, you need to figure yourself out and calm yourself down. We don't have time for this. <laughs> like, <laughs> okay, I'm working on it. And he sent me to the bathroom to get ready. Go figure that out. Get away from me. All you and your stress bubble that you are tornadoing, tor tornadoing around the room like a tornado. Okay. I just made up a word, tornadoing. <laughs> so I went to the bathroom, and I was trying to do my makeup, but I was upset. And I was praying, and I had realized I was really nervous to be there. I don't know how to be around millionaires. And I was trying to think of, like, manners that I had learned in the past and etiquette, you know, like trying to remember what my grandpa taught me about no elbows on the dinner table. And, like, this morning I was brushing my teeth and I dragged my blouse through the sink and then I spit on it. I mean, come on, I got I to gotta get it together. I, I wasn't really, I'm not as graceful as you'd think. My name means gracious, not graceful. So I was really hoping that I wouldn't make Rich look bad, and I represent us, and so I just wanted to present something that was, you know, great. 
and just renewing my mind thinking, I need to calm down. I'm going to be around a bunch of people that are here literally to give money to the persecuted church. They love God, and they don't give a rip about me, right? And so I just had to renew my mind because it wasn't, it wasn't right for me to ruin our time there. It wasn't right for me to ruin Rich's morning or Rich's day by my attitude. And ultimately, God was trying to bless us and give us a blessing by being in this beautiful place around all these incredible people. And I don't want to spoil that. So I could have ruined everything. It would have been easier for me to stay grumpy, you know, <laughs> and upset. But I would have ruined the rest of the moments that God had for me to enjoy. And I tell you that silly story because we ruin things with the stuff in our minds that God has intended us for, for us to enjoy. He's trying to get us some peace. He's trying to get us some blessings. He's trying to help us increase. He's trying to show you revelation and show you things in your life. He's trying to, you know, do incredible things, and then we're stomping around like Martha, like throwing a fit, and we can't see what God is trying to get to us because of what's in our mind. Martha, Martha, Martha. She totally missed out. She was stomping around being extra, by the way, just like I was in the hotel. <laughs> Only Jesus was in her house, so it was a little different. <laughs> Jesus was in her house. So let's imagine that for a second. I have a picture. All right, so that's Martha grinding garlic for the fish. And some old lady is like, you probably should get over in that room, Martha. Look at Jesus in there. And Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet, like, learning, receiving. And I wonder what Jesus was talking to her about. I wonder what he was sharing with her. I wonder what he was giving to her and blessing her with and healing her from. All the cool things that Martha was missing out on. And that moment probably changed Mary's life. But it also probably changed Martha's life. Because this is a moment that I would think that she would have remembered after seeing Jesus on the cross, crucified. She probably carried a lot of regret that she wasn't just at Jesus' feet that day. I missed such an incredible opportunity being with Jesus, and now he's dead on a cross. And I bet she was filled with regret. But how often do we do that in our lives where we're just so busy and so stressed and so just... Our minds are full of negativity. Our minds are full of everything but Jesus, everything but what he's trying to do. And cluttered is the word. Our minds are cluttered with things that don't matter and don't make sense. And we miss out on precious opportunities. So a lot of the things that we are dealing with, some of them are so huge. Some of them are life-changing. I'm not making light of things that are extremely difficult. They're very important. And some things that we're thinking about are not things that we can just, eh, it doesn't matter. I understand that. But also some things, they're totally out of our control. And yet we still worry and we still stress and we still take it upon ourselves to be distracted with it and fearful about it, right? And we have no control over it. Dr. Henry said, control only what we can control and surrender what we can't control. That's some great advice. I'd write that down if I were you. Some things are small, and when they're small, we need to put them in their place, and we need to move on. Take care of it right then, or write it down and do it later. But don't spend the whole day thinking, oh, man, i got to do this. Oh, i got to take care of that. Well, yeah, you can take all the trash. Just do it real quick. And then you don't have to worry about it anymore, right? You got to clean out the fridge. All right. You got to go to the store. Or I don't know what guys do. Run around and what do you guys do? I have no idea. Get the car oil changed. Go get it changed. Stop worrying about it. Some things are just dumb that we're worried about. But we have to ask ourselves a question. Is what I have in my mind out of my control 
Is it something I couldn't even change if I wanted? If it's out of your control, surrender it to God. Stop allowing things to rob you of your joy, of your peace of mind, of your purpose. Stop allowing others to rob you from your joy and your purpose. We get so distracted by other people and what they've done and what they're doing to us. And don't allow them and don't give them the right to do that to you. Right? Put them in their place. You're going to do what you're going to do. Go get on with your bad self. I'm going to think about the things that I need to think about that are more important. Right? And clear up your, your mind space. Right? I like that term, mind space. Mind space. If it's something you could do something about, refer to point one. Get a plan and take action. All right, the third thing. When it comes to renewing your mind, we have to choose to renew your mind. Renewing your mind is like exercise. How many of you started exercise on January? How many of you are still exercising? Yes, two. Yes. Good job, guys. Keep it up. But when you started, was it easy? <laughs> That's terrible, right? Yeah. Well, so is renewing your mind. Yeah. Is it easier now, Chris? Working out, you enjoy it, feels great? It's fun, right? That's how renewing your mind is. You start it, and it's hard, because you got some old, funky habits up in that brain that you got to stop, right? And then when you get going, and you're like, nope, not going to think that way. Nope, not going to do that. You don't let your mind go there anymore, and you start breaking those old habits, and it becomes easier and easier, and you become strengthened in the Lord. And before you know it, you're like, bam, 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 I've got this. And then when it comes to bigger issues, when huge issues hit your life, you're in the habit of renewing your mind, and it's, you got it. You know how to do it. You're in the habit of doing it. So then you, begin, then you can start thinking like Christ thinks about the situations in your life. That's our goal. But you've got to start somewhere. And I'm always shocked at how many people choose to keep their minds negative and keep their minds full of everything except for the word of God. They choose not to renew their mind. Do you guys know why this happens? Well, I'm going to say two reasons, but there might be more. But the first one is, it's just easier to keep worrying and stressing about things than it is to do what's right and to renew your mind. It's way easier to just be mad and grumpy and stressed. And the second thing is, people want things to ruin their day for attention. Because if there's a bad look on your face and you are acting like something's wrong all the time, people are like, are you okay? Are you okay? What's wrong? I noticed your face looks really sad. <sighs> I guess. What's wrong? I'm just stressed out today. You're always stressed out. Knock it off. You're in the habit of being stressed out. You're in the habit of having something always wrong with you. Get in the habit of renewing your mind. Bring joy to the crowd of people. Have something encouraging to say. Give somebody else some encouragement. Bring a smile to the room. Don't be the person that something's always wrong with you. That's not right. Renewing your mind, it's not a suggestion. It's very clear, and it's a command. And as Christians, we are to live renewing our mind. We also want to clear our minds of all that junk to have room for more important things, like God things. It's hard to think about mission or helping your neighbor when you're just consumed in your own junk, in your own trash. So how do we renew our minds? taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. This is, part of, this is the main part of getting your mind in order. So when we're talking about getting your life in order, getting your mind in order, renewing your mind, taking out the trash in your head, um, stop the contaminated thinking. When you start, like in the bathroom when I was trying to get ready, I was thinking, oh, this and all that, and my mind is going all these places, and I was like, no, stop, 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 stop. Annie, stop. And I kept thinking of what Rich told me. Hey, calm yourself. <laughs> calm myself, calm myself. <laughs> and I thought, uh, I'm going to renew my mind, and I just started thinking about the word of God and who he says I am and that I'm called to be here and that he's here to bless, I'm here for him to bless me and 
It's going to be great. And I changed my attitude right on the spot. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and guard your minds in Christ Jesus. Don't be anxious, and in everything, give it to God. So that's, an, that's a call for us to take action, right? We have to do something. Worrying is sin. Did you know that? Okay. So if worry is sin, but we still do it, then we're living in sin. And if we're living fearful lives and we don't renew our mind, we're living in sin. And if we choose to stay distressed, distracted, and live in anxiety, we're choosing to live in sin. So the word repentance is something that has to be regularly on the tip of our tongue, ready to use at any moment. Repent and renew. Repent and renew. Get your mind in the habit of repent and renew. Because when you do that, you're going to start thinking like Jesus thinks, and you're going to make some things happen in your life. We can do it, guys. And the act of obedience, if you do that, it comes with a promise that the peace of God, how many of you guys want the peace of God, will transcend on your life and will give you so much peace and so much understanding, it won't even make sense. The peace, why do you have peace in the storm? I don't know. God gave it to me. I'm not even worried. Why are you so calm? Uh, Jesus? It doesn't make sense. I know it doesn't make sense, but here I am. Right? That's the kind of peace that we can live with. We can't say that it's too hard to renew your mind. It's just the way I am. It's just the way that I'm wired. I'm just like this. Oh, I was diagnosed to have anxiety. That's what the doctor said. He told me that I'm like that. I understand that there's medical issues and chemical imbalances in our bodies, and some of us need help with that. But also, it's also a buzzword that we live with anxiety, and it's not acceptable, right? So we need to die to that stuff. And dying is always hard, but we're called to die to ourselves as Christians. And the last point is that we need to live with purpose. Can I have the timer on the screen? Thank you. So at this conference, I had the privilege of hearing two guests from the persecuted church. They literally traveled from two parts of the world. And where they live, after the conference, they were going back to those places to deal with what I'm about to tell you. And they were sharing these stories. And they came to share the story just because there's a room full of people with a lot of money that want to give a lot of it to the persecuted church. And so it's important that they know the reality and the horror of what's going on over there, right? And so these, um, they got up there and they were telling stories of churches that are being burned and pastors that are being burned and tortured. They were sharing stories about the families, how they're being separated, and they go into the village and they kill all the men. Because with the men gone, there's no provision and there's no protection. And the women and children have to fend for themselves. They have no way to make money. They have no way to get food. They have to try to survive on their own. And the, and the Christian villages are ransacked by the Muslims. And there's eight, nine, ten-year-old girls. They're being forced to marry men three times their age. The men and the boys have a higher percentage of being raped than even the women do. Christian women who are raped, many times they get pregnant by their rapist. And if they don't raise the child to be Muslim, they're persecuted. And all this is happening because they just believe in Jesus. One little kid at school saying one wrong thing, playing with, one wrong classmate one time, and the whole family is kicked out of the village and chased off. And they were telling stories like this, like personal stories, one after the other. 
And I just sat in my chair and I just sobbed about how this could be happening to these people and how terrible it is that someone would do that to someone else. But it really made me reflect on my life and it really put my life into perspective. And last night it, I said that it made me feel American, but what I meant was it made me feel like a spoiled American listening to those stories because we don't have that here. We probably will, but not yet. And I felt like a cultural Christian in that moment. Because the things that I stress over and the things that I'm concerned with, they don't have the privilege of being concerned and stressed over those things. They might be facing eternity within the next 10 seconds with someone busting down their shack, right? And it was... It was really convicting and horribly sad and overwhelmingly heavy to hear all the stuff that's going on over there. And some of the quotes that, they, that I wrote down that the persecuted church was saying was that persecution is a privilege. It was their honor to be persecuted for Jesus. And not being yelled at, being killed, raped, tortured, watching your family being burned. They would stand there and say, this is a privilege for me. When you ask them, how do you do this? How do you handle it? Their response is, I died when I became a Christian, didn't you? When I was feeling so despaired by all of this after they were done speaking, um, their attitude was, don't be despaired by the darkness, but sing in it. And I learned so much from this. There is a much bigger picture. Eternity for these people is just a moment away. And I want to live like that. And the reason I'm telling you to get your life in order and your mind in order is because we are clouded and overwhelmed with so many things that just don't matter when you look at the bigger picture. And we need to simplify and get rid of some of this stuff that's clouding our life, clouding our mind, stealing our vision and our purpose, robbing us of our destiny. God wants me to be flexible. He wants me to have my life in order with no strings attached, ready to obey, not overwhelmed with all the world's concerns. And so I wanted to challenge you this morning, if I haven't already. <laughs> I wanted to challenge you to sit down with yourself and your spouse and your family and prayerfully consider where each area of your life is going. Let's get our lives in order. Let's put things into perspective. Each of you have a higher calling Let's not be cultural Christians distracted by all our to-do lists and all of our emotions and all the things going on in our lives. Let's be focused. Let's, if you've got to do something, do it for a reason. Do it with some purpose. Your health, for example, get it under control and get it in order because when God calls you to do something, you want to be able to do it. It's important. Your finances... Is everything tied down? Is every teeny cent tied down to something? Let's be flexible for God to be used by him. I love the image of us sitting on the edge of our seat, waiting for orders from the Lord, not tied down, not unable to go, but ready to jump up and go all in. But we need to think and act and live with purpose and vision. Amen? All right, let's be standing. Jesus said, no procrastination, no backwards looks. You can't put God's kingdom off until tomorrow. You have to seize the day. Seize the day. Today is the day. In Proverbs 27.1, it's 
tells us that there's no guarantee that the new day will bring opportunities to correct mistakes. When I heard that, that was so convicting because tomorrow is not promised to us. And tomorrow is too late. Oh, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll change tomorrow. I'll figure it out tomorrow. Tomorrow is too late. It's correcting mistakes is gone. Too late. And so we need to have our lives and our minds in order. Lord, I thank you for every person here. Lord Jesus, I just speak clarity over the congregation. I just ask, Lord, that we would be able to hear clearly from you. Put things into perspective like you have for me. What are we doing that's not important? Make it clear to them, Lord. Give them direction. I apply the blood that you shed from your feet over their lives in the name of Jesus. That blood represents direction, that you will have direction everywhere you go, everything that you do. You would know what to do and how to do it. That the Lord will give you wisdom and direction. Lord, I just ask that you would help them to eliminate chaos from their lives, from their schedules, from their health, their eating, from their ministry, their home, everything that's out of order, everything of disorder, help them to rid it of their lives and to be focused on what's important. Jesus, help them to really zone in and, and give you their best. Help them to recognize areas that are not producing the best fruit. If it's half fruit, if it's small fruit, if it's not sweet fruit, I pray that you would help them to eliminate it out of their lives to produce extraordinary fruit. Help them to prune their lives in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you so much for this time, and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Your faith always starts, this always starts with a decision to follow Jesus. And without Jesus, it's very hard to order your life. And some people can figure it out, but the sad part is they work so hard to order their life and then their eternity is out of order. Their eternity is spent in hell. Well, why did God make hell? Well, he didn't make it for you. He didn't make it for me. God made hell for our enemy, the devil, and his fallen angels. He surely doesn't want you to go there. But the problem is we all have sin. We all have sinned. And the Bible says that the wages or the price, the punishment for that sin is hell. It's eternal separation from God because God's perfect and he cannot be around sin. So we can't spend any eternity with him covered in sin. It doesn't work like that. So because there's hell... We go there by our own free choice. He doesn't want us to go there. And what he did was he sent Jesus to rescue us. Jesus came. He lived a perfect life. And he was crucified on the cross. And he died with our sin. He died in our place. He died as our punishment. So that when we ask him to be our Lord and our Savior and we repent for the things that we've done, he comes and he pours his blood that he shed all over us so that we can be free of sin. And we can choose not to go to hell. We can choose heaven. God did everything he could, sending his one and only son to provide a way so that you don't have to go there. So if there's anyone here today that you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. I want you to give your life to him. There's no better way to live. And eternity depends on it. So on the count of three, raise your hand if you want to be saved. One, two, three. Raise your hand. Wave at me. There you go. I see you. Congratulations. Anybody else? Raise your hand up high so I can see you. Raise your hand. Anybody else want to be saved? 
awesome. If you've lived for God before and you have stopped living for the Lord, He is so gracious and He's never stopped searching for you. He's never stopped hunting you down. That's probably why you're here. Because He hasn't given up on you and He never will. And He wants to rescue you and He wants to take you back and help you in your life. So you can rededicate today. You can give your life back to Jesus. You can start it all over. If that's you and you want to rededicate, raise your hand. One, two, three, go. Raise your hand if you want to rededicate. Anybody? You want to live your life full of purpose and victory? Tired of living in chaos? Anybody? All right, amen. Well, I want to meet you, That you that raised your hand up here in the front. I'm not going to embarrass you or make you speak in the microphone. I just want to have a second to pray with you. So church, let's welcome him down. We'll just repeat after me. The whole church is going to pray with you guys. And you're going to give your life to the Lord right now, okay? Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. Please forgive me for my sin. Come into my heart. I want to live for you every day of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. And Lord, I thank you so much. I just ask that you would pour your spirit out on their lives, that they would know that today they are a new creation, that the old things have passed. All your past is gone, erased, and today is a new day. Jesus will use you. He wants to use you and fulfill the purpose that he has in your life. And Lord, I speak that over their lives, that they would know who you are, that they would know how much you love them and how precious you are, how precious they are to you, Jesus. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.